faces there. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Slightly longer hair, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> Not your COVID haircut? <laughs> yes. I've decided I'm going to see how long I can. It's kind of driving me crazy right now, but I'm just trying to chill, 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 and um, see if I can get to uh, an actual ponytail. <laughs> I'm almost there. Well, that's cool. I stopped ponytails maybe 20 years ago, so. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to make it about me. Please. Uh... <laughs> I think maybe if we just give it a few more seconds as the groups kind of settle out. Uh, I yeah. do not envy the people who are in charge of making the tech happen. <laughs> it's good to know that we can actually do this like that. Yeah. I think I learned something new about the technology every time I participate, either as a, you know, as a participant or our behind the scenes. Kind of, oh, we could do that. But it also typically depends on the technology at the participants and in terms of um, how they're accessing things, and so it's not always uh, predictable. Yeah. yeah, in case anybody needed extra sources of unpredictability and rapid change in their life right now, <laughs> Zoom is very helpfully, or whichever other meeting technology. All right, um, Barbara, why don't we why don't we get started? Sure. Um, so maybe the best way to start is just by allowing everyone to introduce themselves. And if you are able to share and willing to share your video feed, or uh, if you have a picture there, it might be a tiny bit easier for us, but otherwise it's fine. Um, please introduce yourselves, great. Um, just a couple of maybe a, a few words about uh, your interest in this topic, uh, why you picked this session and this group in particular, and um, maybe what your experience has been with lessons learned in particular or project to project learning at a, at a high level, we'll get into the details as, as we get into the questions. So I have people on my screen in one particular order, which is probably what we should follow. Um, you might be seeing all different things. So Michael, you're at the top of my screen with your very um, colorful background there. <laughs> The Northern Lights. Yeah. Um, so my name is Michael Lennon. I am not really day-to-day -day involved in knowledge management at USAID uh, in any way, shape, or form, but have been over the years in different things. Um, I happen to have just finished a paper on collective intelligence, which, um, which is um, doesn't look at the organizational structure, but instead, how does the hive perform per se? And, um, and so the project project is the closest to that. I mean, it does have a, it could be institutional or it could be more organic. And um, so that's why I chose it. Thanks. Cool. Um, Emily, you're next. Do you want to say something additional? Um, sure. I guess I would say that I, a million years ago, started my career as a Peace Corps volunteer doing house to house behavior change communication. And that idea of it doesn't help to tell somebody anything that they won't or can't do. And if you already know they can't do it, there's, there's no real value in saying, well, the best practice is, um, the example I always gave is they, they would say, well, your children should drink orange juice for breakfast every morning. And that was in my toolkit. And it's like, they don't have oranges. It's just off the table as a choice here. So that sort of overriding interest in if you're not going to apply it, what was the point in creating the lesson in the first place? Great, thanks. So I don't know your name, but you're the, the fourth. Um, I don't see your name on the screen because it's been changed to project to project knowledge sharing. So the fourth video person there, can you please introduce yourself? Give us your name and, and Hi. Then Why? Yes, yes, yes. Now I think I can change it back to my actual name. Um, nice to be here. So my name is Camille Bakastakas. I'm um, the knowledge management senior specialist on the ideal activity. Uh, so we are a USAID funded activity that convenes um, food security implementers in both development and emergency contexts. So this is particularly interesting for me because this is the, the heart of what we do um, at ideal. Um, and in my previous role as knowledge management senior spe uh, specialist for CRS, this was one of our biggest challenge because a lot of programming um, similar in many contexts, 
uh, but the the lessons learned transfer is always hardest, even with the best intentions, even with the the right staff in place. It's there's always uh, there's always something to be worked through. Um, yeah. So, and I did want to ask you all: Is it okay if I eat lunch? Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Um, then I have Shabnam Kabir. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Shabnam, and I'm a program associate here at Staff. Um, to be honest, I don't know much about knowledge management, but I'm definitely looking forward to learning more. And I will also be taking notes um, for this session. Thank you. Great, thank you. And then I have M. Matz. Um, I don't want to guess if it's Michael or... Monica. Monica. <laughs> Oh, Monica. Uh, yes. So yes. I hi. <laughs> um, I'm Monica Matz. I'm uh, with USAID in uh, the Policy Bureau. I'm a senior senior learning advisor. Um, I'm interested in this topic uh, for one because many many years ago I worked in knowledge management at Comonix, so I'm interested to hear what you're focusing on now, Barbara. Um, and um, I think this is the sort of uh, project to project, activity to activity, um, knowledge transfer is something uh, as an agency we could uh, improve quite a bit. So I'm interested to hear others' perspectives too. And uh, regret that I have to jump off at two o'clock. So just a uh, heads up on that. But thank you for hosting this. Yep, thank you. And next I have Thomas, Thomas Liu. Hello, um, I'm a um, consultant here at SID Washington and just like Shabnam, I don't have too much experience. Uh, and so I'm just here to learn more. Great, great, thank you, welcome. And finally, Tindy. Hi everyone, I am Tindy Sikasi. I am joining all the way from Kenya in, in East Africa. And I'm so excited to be uh, in this meeting. I was invited uh, by my colleague uh, from Global Communities called Ashley Molinak. And so um, I work as uh, the Collaboration Learning and Adaptation Officer for a USAID a funded program here in Kenya and uh, Global Communities that uh, basically supports uh, inclusive businesses. So. Sorry, that's a lot, but I'm just excited. And uh, we're actually in the process of uh, collecting and documenting lessons within the program. So this was timely, so I'll be taking notes. So am I the only one who's not hearing the, it's not very clear for me. I'm not, like it's kind of breaking up a little bit. I'm not sure, okay. So we'll try Sorry, to... I'll, I'll type, I'll type on the chat box. No, no, it was perfect now. So maybe it's just a question of oh. being closer to the <laughs> mic or something like that. Yeah, I think it'll be fine. Um, so it says eight people, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yes, okay, so we went through, through all of it. So welcome, and I think this is gonna be a, a great conversation. Um, do we need to set up a, um, a note taker? Did we set up Shabnam and taking notes or is she taking notes? Uh, yes, I'll be taking notes. Okay. All right, excellent. So um, the next thing we can do probably is for me to give you a little bit more information about the scenario that we're gonna be talking about. There's actually not a lot to say or to, to share with you. I should be able to share my screen, right? Share screen. And let's see. While Barbara's doing that, is there somebody who wants to volunteer to report back to the bigger group? Are you seeing my screen? Yep. But I meant to, sh okay, like this. This is Mike, I'll do it. Thank you. I hate to be the male in the, the, the <laughs> whole, it's like, okay, whatever. <laughs> you, you did wait somebody a decently wants long to, time. Please speak now. I'm sorry? <laughs> I said you did wait a decently long time before jumping yes. in. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, this is a real, a real scenario that is currently uh, ongoing in my, my work. Um, we have two projects with a very similar digital platform uh, 
uh, effort to facilitate e-commerce. Uh, so the home office obviously is in, in Washington DC, although nowadays we're all kind of spread out anyway. <laughs> Some of us are in different locations, not really in DC, but um, it, it complicates things a little bit. It's kind of fun. Um, the, the first project is in Georgia. It's currently in its fourth of five year uh, of implementation. And it's working with a farmer's association to create this one, one, shop, uh, one stop shop for farmers to sell their crops in an, some kind of e-commerce platform. And they're serving the hospitality industry specifically. Um, and I know from recent conversations with the project that the initial concept and what they've achieved and now are moving towards in year four are kind of you know, things have evolved, just they, they started with one idea and it's kind of evolved into a lot of different, um, different directions in a, in a very good way, but in different directions. The Philippines project is in year one of a five year project. So it's a, kind of the, the early stages. Um, and the, the idea there is to facilitate end to end transactions from farmers to consumers. So the slightly different approach obviously not the same country context. Um, and they're in, in a much earlier stage of the, the project life cycle. Also, they just started this past year. So within a few weeks of starting the project, COVID um, happened and that has created both challenges and opportunities for them. Um, so that's the, the, their context right now. Uh, I don't, yeah, so I don't actually have more details in terms of the contents of the project. I mean, I do because I've talked to the project, but I don't think the specifics of what they are doing are actually necessarily very relevant to what we're trying to address in terms of ensuring that they share lessons. So um, maybe I'll just open it for any, any basic questions about what those two projects are doing so that we are clear on the, the overall context. And then we'll get into the, which stages do we want the conversation to focus on because we probably can't address all of it. So do we, do we want to focus on um, how to capture the lesson? Do we want to focus on how to share them? You know, what's the stage of the lessons learned process that we want to, to address um, in our conversations? But first, are there any questions in terms of what, what they're trying to do. No. Um, not in terms of what they're trying to do, Barbara, but what would you say from your conversations with them are sort of the biggest obstacles right now to doing this? Um, so initially, so let me give you a little bit of background into how this came into my, my shop. Like, how did I get to hear about these projects? There are something like 70 projects ongoing around Timonics. I don't get to know every one of them in detail. And sometimes opportunities for cross project sharing just are um, happen in, in unusual ways. And, and so in this case, um, I heard about it from our digital development specialist. Uh, senior advisor who is more in tune with all of the projects across the board across the regions that have a digital development component and she noticed that these two projects were doing something similar brought it to my attention because she wanted a little bit of support for um, a virtual session that we're going to end up doing and so initially she actually approached me and she said these two projects have a lot in common how do we get them to talk to each other and when we started talking to to them individually we realized, well, Georgia is really in year four. They have a lot uh, that they've already achieved. Um, they have a lot of lessons already. Whereas, um, and they, they've obviously encountered some challenges as well, right? But the Philippines is in year one. They're still figuring out what they're doing in terms of how they're actually gonna implement all of it. And um, so their challenges are very different at that point, right? They're, they're still, um, and because of COVID, they're pivoting, they're adapting, they're changing the way they're approaching things. So we ended up 
uh, instead of a, what would have been a, a knowledge exchange where they both exchange, you know, both ways, this is now turning into more of a, Georgia is going to share their lessons with the Philippines and the Philippines is going to ask a lot of questions. And in the process, it's quite possible that Georgia will ask, will learn something as well, right? Um, so in, in terms of the biggest challenges, um, some of it has to do with technology, but I wouldn't want to just focus on that. The technology platforms are always going to have, you know, as long as if there is a digital development component, there's going to be a technology component and there's going to be some technology challenges, but not, uh, that's typically not the, the end all be all. So um, in terms of discussing the opportunities for learning, capturing and sharing the lessons for these two projects, we should try to focus on two of the three stages, um, which focus on identifying the critical knowledge or lessons worth capturing and sharing. Like, how do we identify that? How do we know what's worth um, talking about in terms of lessons? We could um, talk about how to adequately capture the lessons, which is more how do we um, how do we write them up or how do we record them? Or what's the, what would be the most effective process in the context of these two projects? Or, uh, or and, we have to pick two of the three. Um, how do we share and how do we make sure that we share and apply the lessons? And um, so which ones, which ones do, we, do we want to focus on as the first one? I mean, the logic would be to start with the, you know, how do we identify the critical knowledge? But we can, we can dig um, deeper into how to capture the lessons as well. Any preferences? Barbara, I hope I'm audible. Yes, you are. Thanks. Um, I, I'll be interested in how to capture, though all the three categories seem interesting. So capturing, anybody else wants to focus on that? I think that would be a very um, appropriate topic for this one. You know, how do you capture the lessons from Georgia essentially and, um, and share them or how do we share and capture? Like what's the process? So let me, um, maybe I can stop sharing my slides so you can actually see more of each other. I don't think the slides are gonna be critical at this point. Emily, let me know if we should actually do that, but I think this is better like this. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. So how do we, how do we capture? So we have two projects. Um, how do we, how do we capture the lessons? How do we capture the needs, the knowledge needs of one and the other? And what do we mean by capturing? Yeah, I guess I guess my question, well, it sort of relates to what you just brought up about kind of the distinction between capturing and then sharing and using, um, because I think you know um, it's hard to know now in year one which of the various lessons the Georgia project has will be useful to the Philippines, right? Because you're not sure yet what challenges they'll come across or I mean, maybe, maybe you could predict to some degree, but um, some of the lessons from the Georgia project will not be applicable to this one, um, but some of them will. So um, I, I guess <laughs> just asking another question, is it, uh, do we try to then um, capture everything um, in the event that some of it might be useful or do you try to think ahead of, uh, about which of the lessons are likely to come up for the the newer project or I don't know because I think it's more it's it's about like meeting that new team um, where they're with um, knowledge that addresses their particular need when they need it um, so how do you address that challenge? 
Yeah, any other, any other thoughts before I jump back in? Yeah, I have an, uh, another question for us. Um, is the knowledge capture from Georgia, is that really the only focus for that is for peer assist to the Philippines or are there other purposes for the organization as well? Because right. that then defines the kinds of questions we ask Georgia. Mm -hmm. Michael? Yeah, um, what I thought um, was most interesting about the story that you were telling was that um, somebody out of the blue, you didn't choose it, you weren't, even if you were in a coordinating role, um, somebody else came to you and said, hey, I think these two dots are gonna be connected and I would like to kind of pursue that more actively. And it might be that tomorrow there's gonna be somebody else with two other links. And, yeah. and, um, uh, and so less, um, less about having the master orchestrator as it is how to facilitate the self-directed discovery by individuals um, that's get, how, how do people see outside their swim lanes and and if we if we frame it as the capturing um, sometimes people have no idea what they're going to discover whether or not their hypothesis was accurate or not it turns out that maybe these two projects are a great fit and maybe the after after a conversation or two they're like you know what uh, they should be talking to somebody else and they want to move on and so so uh, bringing attention to uh, I use the word collective learning or another popular term is the idea of hive learning. Um, you know, an immune system does not have a brain coordinating how it learns. Um, there's a series of practices and roles that the cells in each have as different functions and collectively they learn, but it's not found in a, in a database called, you know, the medial anterior lobe or, you know, something of that sort. And so this question of, um, how to attend to um, not the mechanics of, of a process that is institutional, but this um, organic uh, process that is distributed. Um, and what are the things that need to be attended to um, in order that you know, uh, anyone coming from anywhere can, can find these paths and, um, and, and extend them? Yeah, no, th those are a great point. So, um, and I'll, I'll get back to, to Camille, some, some of Camille's points and, and Monica's points. Um, so if you, if you remember the three, the Venn diagram that I showed earlier, uh, part of it is individual or group experience. Like what is the experience in Georgia? What is the experience in the Philippines? And then the second uh, circle is the network. And so how do you get these two projects to encounter each other in that bigger network, which is our social enterprise, in Kimonics, it's our, our social enterprise networking platform. How do you get them to connect through that, realize that there is a connection, you know, something they could share, have a conversation in the platform or off of the platform so that they just talk to each other. And then the digital development specialist whose job is or responsibility is to kind of collect or capture or facilitate or coordinate around digital development gets involved if and when needed, but allows a lot of these interactions to happen more naturally, so that or organically, like you were saying, so that we don't in the home office end up constantly being called upon to capture, document, and do all these things, which as third parties, we never do perfectly, right? <laughs> so trying to connect the projects to talk to it to each other more naturally and organically is, is actually the longer term role that we're, we're saying that we're trying to, prom to promote. Right now we're still in the stage of identifying these opportunities and uh, supporting them and encouraging them and, and creating the environment where they can more easily talk to each other and find the time to talk to each other. Um, so we are, we're trying, but Part of my challenge is these are very, these opportunities that we discover are often too ad hoc. Like we, it's, there might be 20 different projects who should be talking to each other and are, we're, we're not connecting them. And very often I find, well, the project in Ukraine actually has been talking to the project in Moldova for three years. I mean, they, they talk to each other all the time and I never knew about it and that's perfectly fine. <laughs> So we are not fully, from the home office, we are never fully aware 
of all of the connections and knowledge sharing that happens totally naturally because people knew each other, because they were the previous COP here and there. And so the networks that exist that I have no control over, that they are organically working their magic, then we have to support the areas where things are not happening because the connections are not there. Um, so that's kind of where we do want to provide some structure, we do want to provide some facilitation, but we also want to leverage the existing more organic networks that exist. Um, does that make sense? And definitely one thing we see at CARE is the, like Michael used the term swim lanes, right? Like it's really easy to get stuck. And sometimes there are super interesting connections that aren't obvious. And it's not about, oh, they're both using the same kind of digital platform. It's like, and this is one that I think about all the time, health extension workers and agricultural extension workers, there's a lot of the same principles behind that, right? You have people going out into a community to try to convey information. The health teams and the food teams never talk to each other about that on the back end, right? About like, oh, here's what we're learning about agriculture extension because, well, we're helping their food and it's not the same thing. But it's a similar kind of underpinning. So how do you facilitate some of those connections that are less likely to happen organically, but can be really transformative? Yeah, I have a question related to that actually for all of you. Um, I'm, I'm seeing a lot more um, cross-cutting kind of things happening where our traditional ways of organizing things by sector are no longer appropriate. And so that the learning by sector is no longer sufficient either. Have you seen efforts in your organizations or in, in, you know, in the industry in general to create more cross-sectoral learning and knowledge sharing? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, maybe I can give an example. Uh, here in Kenya, what we are doing as uh, global communities, and I hope you can hear me, uh, we are supporting uh, worker cooperative businesses. And these are new uh, business models here in Kenya. And so we have to go through a lot of uh, advocacy around it and awareness. But we realize that in, 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 in these are businesses also, yeah? So we have to um, invite uh, small and medium enterprise businesses that are not worker owned in the same room so that they can both uh, share knowledge and research. And, and this small and medium enterprise owners are in various other sectors. So we see how uh, uh, sharing ideas from different sectors and bis different business models still adds value and sharing lessons still adds value in the core work and the core goal, which is basically to make uh, this business as more pro profitable. Great, yeah, I think, I think a lot more um, is happening and needs to happen even more in terms of cross-sectoral um, knowledge sharing and addressing issues that are cross-sectoral in nature. Um, and digital development obviously is, is totally across the sectors. Um, there was something that Camille was saying earlier that I, I wanted to comment on and I lost the, the thought at that point. Well, going back a little bit to capturing um, and, and maybe that's what it was around, uh, how do we know what to capture? Like, how do we know what's going to be relevant to the next project? Well, in this case, um, we're very interested in the here and now. Like, what is it that the Philippines really needs now? And so we're going to be, instead of, the focus is not actually going to be on capturing, and that's not the way we're approaching it right now. Um, actually, the person who is leading the effort from the digital development perspective, her background is really, uh, is journalism. So she wants to create a conversation. She wants to facilitate a conversation between the two teams. She's already talked to each of them separately and we've had one conversation with the team leads, um, you know, exploring the concept of this, this conversation. And um, next week, we're bringing the two teams together for a um, uh, recorded and live conversation, facilitated conversation where they're gonna be um, able to present their project briefly. And then um, my colleague will be facilitating the conversation, ensuring that they're asking each other questions. So it's more of a 
two-way conversation rather than just us trying to capture anything from it. My role in there is to try to sit through, I mean, uh, engage and listen mostly, mostly listen and try to see if there is something worth capturing for more of a long-term organizational perspective. Like, um, but the main objective is for those two teams to actually talk to each other at length. So the next question I was uh, contemplating, which I'm now throwing to you all, is if we're going to have them um, talking to each other as, as um, uh, in a conversation, we're facilitating a conversation, um, what should we be thinking about? Like, who, who is part of the conversation? What, what, um, what kinds of questions are we going to be asking them? Um, how, do we, how do we structure this conversation? And who should be part of it? Michael? So without answering that question head on, I, um, <clears throat> because it can always vary depending on the context, what, what questions should be asked, what, so it's, it's kind of a, it's a many to many kind of thing. Um, I would like to offer, in fact, I, I will make a plug for, um, I mentioned I was writing uh, a paper, it's a short brief, it was not intended to be a master anything, instead it's a six, eight page thing that got presented at an artificial intelligence conference last week. And, um, and, and it's the idea of distributed intelligence, what are the conditions that have to be placed in human systems for, for projects to kick off. And it's, it's about the problem that kind of Emily was getting at, you know, often people have mental barriers that get in the way of of, you know, they're doing similar things, but they have different hats and therefore they don't talk to each other because of, and so it's like, what can be done for transdisciplinary uh, uh, contacts? You know, whether, whether transdisciplinary means within an organization or in this case across. So plug number one is um, right there in the chat. And plug number two is a video summary, which by the way, be forewarned, was very messy. It was my first attempt at this. <laughs> and let's just say there's room for improvement. But um, but uh, the point is that, um, for example, psychological safety is a huge factor that is operating below the. And if you have um, people who, for example, me coming in as male and as outsider, if I come across as too know it all, all of a sudden I trigger threat in everybody, and and the intention of being synergistic gets completely undermined by things that I'm not aware of. And so mm -hmm. attending to psychological safety um, is a huge factor for effective uh, organizational um, transmission of knowledge. Um, there are other factors in this paper, four that are listed, they're all kind of evidence-based. If folks wanna talk about it more, would love to, but I'll, I'll stop pushing the, pushing the, uh, um, uh, the paper. Uh, I will say that um, working with uh, Monica in the past kind of uh, framed the approach to this paper in ways that you remember how um, <laughs> Stacy asked some questions and it was like, and what is the evidence? This is kind of along those lines, um, but uh, you know, different questions and different, different evidence. But hopefully um, part of the goal was not to be encyclopedic, but to come up with enough to get people going. And, um, and that's why this whole, how much to capture, what to capture, that can just get, it's, it's like, I don't, I don't know that the, that's the question people, people should put their energy into. And instead how to get going and they will either stay with it or they won't. But uh, the whole, you know, document it all is just, um, it's, it's an area of low, um, low energy. Uh, uh, for people either, let me just stop there. We said no complaining, so let me not complain. <laughs> but we said we, it's, okay to, it's okay to bring up the challenges, but we need to um, try to think through in terms of, okay, how do we move forward, right? Uh, so thank you for sharing those, those links. I do, um, I do think psychological safety is a very, very big uh, issue. And in, this, in the context of those two projects, mm -hmm. um, we had to think through 
I mean, it had impact. I mean, it's not like it had an impact on, on how we're moving forward, but we have to think it through, like who within the project teams do we invite to this conversation? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who is going to be the audience? Like, are we opening it up to the client? Are we inviting the mission staff to uh, participate in this? Are we making it completely internal so that um, they can actually talk very openly about the challenges that they're having or something like that? Um, are we actually limiting it to the two teams and no audience so that they're just going in the deep in the weeds of the technical issues and all that? Um, or is it open to the whole of Chemonics so that we actually have a broader audience willing, I mean, able to learn from those two experiences and able to experience how two projects should be and could be sharing. So there's lots of things to consider in terms of, um, even if we agree that it's a simple conversation or set of conversations, there's still lots of potential uh, issues to discuss in terms of who's, who's attending, who's beneficiary of this sharing and, and all that. Yeah. I actually am very skeptical that I will capture much of anything of value. And that doesn't mean there will be no value in the conversation. I think there will be a lot of value in the conversation. I just, I am not the right person to capture those as more of a knowledge management expert and not so much a technical expert in those issues. I would need a technical expert to come attend and tell me or help me figure out what needs to be captured that's valuable. Because I'm going to capture things at a very high level as somebody who's not an expert in this topic. And what I'm gonna create a couple of very generic um, lessons that nobody will find particularly useful. So there, you know, who, who's capturing is also another issue that um, we, could, uh, we could address as well. So um, I don't know where we are actually, we, we've kind of gone into an interesting cycle of, of, of different, different uh, sides of the issue. Um, I'm, so if we are not going to, in this case, I don't think I will capture in the sense of write a formal lesson learn out of this or several lessons, we are still going to um, capture the event in some sense. We are going to record the conversation and that's another issue, to record or not to record. And if you record um, how to share it and how to make it available, and if you do make it available, you just put it in a repository of videos or repository or whatever, um, how do you ensure in some way that somebody is going to find it, use it? Um, will people actually view an hour and a half long of conversation just to try to maybe get a couple of insights out of it once it's been recorded? So what's the value of all of these capture efforts, regardless of whether it's capture in writing or capture as a video. What is the value um, and how do we facilitate the sharing beyond just the event itself, which is itself a sharing, knowledge sharing between those two teams. So throwing it back out to all of you. So one thing with my facilitator hat on, we've got about five minutes left. So uh, I'm never sure when these breakout rooms happen. Sometimes it's like getting kind of, you know, hooked off stage that all of a sudden it's just gone. So yeah. Got a couple minutes before that. Um, two things that sparked for me. One is this idea about like who attends the meeting and who doesn't. And we just recently had uh, a pause and reflect session between two different projects. And part of what we noticed was the chiefs of party ended up doing all of the talking. And there was this real deference hierarchy in a way that we probably would have done better to have a session that was field staff talking to each other and a different session that was management talking to each other because that would have opened things up differently. Um, and, and that was something we hadn't really considered going in. So what is it about those like hierarchies and who's in the room and what do they feel safe to say, like Michael said. Um, so I think that's one question. The other thing we've noticed a lot about the sort of like, well, do you record and then what do you record and, and then does anybody ever find it or watch it again? Is, is that signposting, right? Is like, what is the version of this in one sentence? What is the version of this in three sentences? What, it, what are the four tags that you assign? And as somebody who, one of the knowledge management repositories I work with goes back to 1998 and it's fascinating to go digging through the tag architecture there. <laughs> oh, that was what they were calling this. What, what was this buzzword in 1998? I don't 
recognize it and I don't even know what to like translate it to. Um, that evolves, but at least it gives you a little bit of a hook into something instead of having to, to go back um, and, and just read everything all the way from scratch. Um, and it is easier to translate the, I'm struggling to even think of an example of, oh, um, maternal and child health is one that like the set of letters in that acronym has shifted dramatically over the last two decades, right? It's like how to, but it's easier to translate the acronym than to try to go back and find the entire document and figure out what was in there. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's, that's true. Um, and I mean, I have the same challenges in terms of um, organizing our, our documents and changing taxonomies and things like that. Yeah. Um, but the technology is getting much better uh, in terms of helping you filter and sift through the, the entire text, even of, uh, and transcripts of videos. So the technology can help to some extent. I'm not a strong believer in that as a complete solution, but it, it can help. Um, I, do, I do think that there is a lot of value in you know, the, the abstract, like a, a simple abstract to give you a sense of what, what it's about. Um, and that's where sometimes written lessons um, can be useful because if you can, it's very difficult, but if you can uh, state the key lesson of something, whatever, the key lesson learned in one paragraph, in one, in one paragraph, you're, you've already done a great service in terms of um, getting, you know, making sure people don't actually have to go through the hour and a half unless they find something interesting in that one paragraph and they can actually or you know, spend the time. So it, it helps with filtering because there's so much to digest out there. There's too much information, too much, too many lessons almost that we can't really absorb. So uh. one thing is um, Karen, who used to work at IADB, um, they used to be in charge of their knowledge management division, would talk about the importance of context being a part of the lesson learned. And I think especially as we're moving to a lot more cross-functional, cross-silo thinking, saying something like, well, this was a program that happened in big cities with high digital literacy versus something that happened in a rural area with no cell phone connectivity. Even those very short descriptors can be incredibly helpful to help weed through this might apply or it might not apply. Um, and that's something I notice for us, we often leave out of a lesson learned. Like we just don't, you know, we talk about, it's really important to invest in this kind of a partnership, but we haven't said, well, that works when the partners are sub grantees and you've, you've got a relationship that's been going on for 10 years so you can work in the following ways, right? And yeah, adding I, books is useful. And I think this is what's, I'm hoping this is what is going to happen in the conversation next week between the Philippines and, and Georgia, where as they start talking to each other, like having this back and forth, um, the Philippines will realize, will start asking questions about the context. It's like, you did that, but how, how could you? Like, what, what context allowed you to do that that is not necessarily the context that we have in the Philippines? Or what is in the Philippines that could help us do this while you were not doing, you were doing something else? So I think the more interesting part of that conversation that I'm expecting next week is going to be precisely those context-specific elements um, that, that they can learn from and realize, well, this is unique to us or this is unique to our, our context and maybe Asian countries or whatever it is that's the, the context-specific thing. And then um, I hope maybe that's, that maybe that's the part I will end up capturing. That's where... This is interesting to me in the sense that I have no idea. Um, I have some idea what the conversation is going to be because we kind of planned it out a little bit. But in a sense, I have no idea what will be captured if there is anything to capture. And that's perfectly fine. I'm perfectly fine with that. Uh, we, we need a little bit of uh, willingness to stick with the ambiguity of some of these activities. Um, I, I'm wondering if there are any questions um, from from the rest of the group in terms of how we've been talking of capturing and sharing the knowledge from this this particular scenario. Thomas, Tindi, Shabnam, any questions or comments?
Not quite. I've just uh, really been taking notes, so thank you. <laughs> so one of the um, obvious challenges of this exchange that's going to happen next week is the, the time zones. <laughs> So the Philippines, we'll, we're doing this in very early morning here in DC, which will be midday in uh, or early afternoon in uh, Georgia. And it will be late in, late in, well, early evening or kind of late afternoon in uh, Philippines, like after work. So we're asking these project teams to kind of, some of them at least, to, to do this with us. And, um, We've already had two 5 a.m. conversations with, with them. So this requires a little bit of extra commitment to do this, to have these live conversations, but it's essential. I mean, none of this knowledge sharing can really happen if we only rely on the email and um, the occasion, I mean, the, one, the, the phone call to one project and the other. We need to eventually put them in the same room talking to each other. In this case, there won't be a huge um, language issue. The Georgia team's English is, is perfectly fine and the Philippines is perfectly fine, so we won't have that. If we try to do this with a, um, uh, a project in um, Latin America and a project in French-speaking Africa, then <laughs> the challenges are a little bigger, but that's, that's typical of international development, so it's not, um, it's not unique. Um, so, I don't know if this is of interest to, to anyone here, but uh, when we try to write lessons down, a whole new set of challenges emerge, not just in terms of how much of the context can we capture, because it's difficult to know what elements of the context are actually context specific, it's like what, what, what elements of the lessons are context specific or not. But then really in, in the art of writing the lesson, like um, I don't know if it's your experience, but if you read, and uh, Emily, you were, you were touching on that earlier. If you read the final reports of projects and there's typically a lessons learned section at the, at the end or in some section, um, they're, how, how useful are they? Like what can you, can you take them out of the report and put them somewhere for people to read? No. Can you, um, can you actually, are they actionable? Can you do something with them? And, and typically they're not. Typically um, they're articulated as results of the projects um, as opposed to real lessons. And because of psychological safety and other contract related issues, nobody's really that interested in saying we actually failed at this because X, Y, Z, and this is what we learned from it. Therefore, um, maybe half the lessons never make it in the, the report because that's going to be a public report. And so do you... Bingo. <laughs> <laughs> and then do you uh, internally manage to have an honest conversation about what failed and what worked well? Or are the incentives to focus on what worked well, which because that's what you are gonna publish and that's what you're gonna spend a lot of time on, are those incentives so overwhelming that even internally it's difficult to talk about or write or document what's not working? Um, those are the things I, I think about and struggle with. And our Georgia project is very, very proud of its successes. And um, I'm, I'm trying to challenge them to talk about what hasn't worked. <laughs> uh, there has to be things that haven't worked and I'm sure they can put it in a, a positive spin on it, but I want them to talk to the, the challenges as well, and not just put a rosy picture out there for the Philippines to absorb. So um, any, any experiences in your, your work around how to manage that? I actually do a, a huge body of work at CARE on learning from failure, and we're just putting out now our second round of, we read through all of your reports and here's what broke. 
um, which is one of the most interesting projects I do every year. Um, a couple things that have helped there. One is anonymity. So like, we'll tell you about the context and then we'll tell you what broke, but we won't tell you who broke it. <laughs> and that helps. And like, we'll tell you the context, but vague enough that you can't say, oh, it's this exact project. Another thing that I've found is really helpful is if you frame to people, what would you do differently if you could do it all over again? So not what failed, not what didn't, you know, what didn't work, but if you could change it, knowing what you know now, you could start all over again. And that's where it feels like people are, um, uh, are more comfortable having those conversations. Uh, we are also getting nudged that we should go back to the same room. I had assumed that the technology would just pull us in, but I think we all have to like physically click the little mm -hmm. leave room button. <laughs> yeah, you have to. Sorry. All right. No, no worries. I didn't realize. I assumed it would just shut when we were done. So. All yeah. right. So thank you.